Hi, welcome to Hanging on His Words. My name's Ken Heidebrecht, and I've noticed a trend over the past few years that seems to be gaining a lot of inertia. What trend? Questioning our heliocentric globe Earth cosmology and scrutinizing its validity to the truth of our Creator's words. Words that he spoke and had his faithful prophets record for us long ago. Not only are believers who have had a previous faith in the creator of the heavens and the earth coming to different conclusions regarding this matter, but many people who have never had faith in the creator before are seeing that his word can be trusted and backed by their own experiences. The Most High has placed a desire in my heart to present a version of his creation model that can be easily understood and conceptualized with the usage of graphics and, of course, with scripture. The Apostle Paul commended a group of Berean Jewish believers in Acts chapter 17 for doing their due diligence in receiving what he had to say about the Messiah and testing it to the scriptures found in what we call the Old Testament today. My recommendation is that you do the same with all of my videos. If my videos have aided in your faith walk in any way, I simply ask that you would like, share, subscribe, and comment in the comment section below. Even something as simple as hi, I agree, I disagree, whatever. It's great for the algorithms. In doing any of these, these videos will end up in areas of cyberspace that I, on my lonesome, cannot reach without your help. If you're interested in supporting my ministry, there are options in the video description below for both Patreon and PayPal. And I want to thank my patrons and PayPal donators for all their support. It blesses me and allows me to sew back into the ministry. I pray that you were edified and encouraged by this teaching. Now, on to day one of creation. I fear to be wise, or at least appropriate, to start this video off with a general disclaimer. And we all know that videos that have disclaimers in them are intriguing, right? <laughs> at least that's been my experience. Unlike brothers Enoch, Abraham, Isaiah, Ezekiel, Paul, John, and many other prophets that were given a unique experience in their lifetime, I have not ascended into the heights of heaven, like these men, nor have I descended into the depths of Sheol. I have been on this earth plane for going on 34 years now, and what I'm going to be talking about in this video is based off of the understanding that I've gleaned from the words that they've recorded for us. I should also add that the men I just mentioned didn't traverse through the firmaments of heaven when they were extracted from the earth in their bodies of flesh. The texts, depending on which ones we read, say that they were either taken up in the spirit, or they were shown visions, either when they were asleep, or even when they were awake. I think it's important that we understand that because no man has ascended through the firmaments of heaven save one, our Savior, Yeshua HaMashiach, Jesus the Messiah. We need to keep that in mind as we contemplate the biblical creation model and how it relates to our salvation. Salvation being the redemption of our bodies, the freeing of our souls from Sheol, so that we too can ascend the heights of the heavens and dwell with our Father and the holy angels in his kingdom for an eternity. In the beginning, God made the heavens and the earth. But the earth was unsightly and unfurnished, and darkness was over the deep, and the Spirit of God moved over the water. And God said, Let there be light, and there was light. And God saw the light, that it was good, and God divided between the light and the darkness. And God called the light day, and the darkness he called night. And there was evening, and there was morning the first day. 
For on the first day he created the heavens which are above, and the earth, and the waters, and all the spirits which serve before him, the angels of the presence, and the angels of sanctification, and the angels of the spirit of fire, and the angels of the spirit of the winds, and the angels of the spirit of the clouds, and of darkness, and of snow, and of hail, and of hoarfrost, and all the angels of the voices, and of the thunder, and of the lightning, and the angels of the spirits of the cold, and of heat, and of winter, and of spring, and of autumn, and of summer, and of all the spirits of his creatures, which are in the heavens and on the earth. He created the abysses, and the darkness, even tide and night, and the light, dawn and day, which he has prepared in the knowledge of his heart. And thereupon we saw his works, and praised him, and lauded before him on account of all his works, for seven great works did he create on the first day. All right, so now I'm going to present to you the first day of creation. We just read the texts in Genesis 1 and Jubilees chapter 2, and we're going to go over each and every one of them. So we're going to start with the seven great works of creation on day one, as was just mentioned in Jubilees chapter 2 verse 3. Now before I get into that, I would like to comment on the visual I have up on the screen right now. So what you're seeing here obviously is darkness, and then we have a representation. All right, this is obviously not meant to portray what I think, you know, Yahweh and his son looks like. It's just these are pictures I found online, and it's just part of the, the model that I'm trying to present. Okay, so I don't want anybody getting overly dogmatic about the fact that I use certain pictures and certain depictions of these characters when that's all they are, are depictions. So here we have Yahweh with Yeshua. And, you know, they obviously existed from the beginning, before all things were created. Now, I've done videos that you can find on my channel. Um, one was called Who is Yahweh? And the other is The Firstborn. And both of them talk about how there is a father and there is a son. There's two separate entities. We have Yahweh the Father and we have Yeshua the Son. My belief is that Yeshua did not always exist. He was not the Father. And just as the references up on the screen imply, Yeshua was the firstborn of all creation. Just like he was the firstborn from the dead. So that in all things he can be first place. Praise him. Alright, so we have the firmaments of heaven. It's the first great work of creation. Now I have six layers in brackets here because I do believe on day one there were six firmament layers that were created. And I'm going to show you why I believe that. But before we get to those passages, and there are many of them, we need to start with the foundations of the heavens. So, in Job 26, 11, and I'm going to be reading out of the Septuagint. The pillars of heaven are prostrate and astonished at his rebuke. I love the book of Job because it reveals so much about the creation model. And in this passage, we see that there's pillars of heaven, which makes sense because... Heaven, which I believe is the firmament, the name of the firmament, needs to sit on something. There needs to be a foundation of sorts. So we have these pillars. Now, what do we see ascending from below here? Well, those would be winds. And not just any average wind. These are very particular winds. And Enoch was shown these winds. In chapter 18 of his book, I highly recommend reading the entire book, but refer to chapter 18. I'm just going to read the first two verses out of it. It says, I saw the treasuries of all the winds. I saw how he had furnished with them the whole creation and the firm foundations of the earth. And I saw the cornerstone of the earth. I saw the four winds which bear the earth and the firmament of the heaven. So he saw winds bearing up the firmament of heaven which is interesting because 
I mean, what are the foundations of the heavens resting on? Well, if we're going to trust Enoch's account, which I do, there are four great winds which are holding this entire creation model up. Wind plays an integral part of the overall system of this model, and I'm going to get into that in other videos, but I just wanted to touch base on that really quick. Okay, so we've got the first firmament, or I guess it would technically be the seventh firmament, because I do believe that there are seven firmaments in this entire creation model, and Yahweh sits on the seventh one. So we got the sixth one, the fifth, the fourth, the third, and before I get to the second one, I'm going to read a bunch of scriptures that show why I believe there are multiple firmaments. And starting with Genesis chapter 1 verse 1, In the beginning God made the heavens and the earth. Okay, so that doesn't prove that there are multiple firmament structures, but if you guys have watched my video Firmament Waters Above, in it I explain, I break down the Greek and the Hebrew of the word heaven and firmament, and... Essentially, chapter 1, verses 6 to 8, reveals that Yahweh called the name of the firmament heaven. So, if we just want to extract that bit of information and impose it on the following uh, scriptures that I'm going to read where we see heavens, just think, it's a synonymous term for the firmament. So Jubilees chapter 2 verse 2 says, For on the first day he created the heavens, plural, which are above, and the earth. And once again, that corresponds, obviously, with the previous passage I just read where there's multiple heavens. And it makes sense if you think about it. Yahweh had to create the domain where he lives above first, right? If we go to First Enoch, chapter 1 verse 4, it says, And the eternal God will tread upon the earth, even on Mount Sinai, and appear in the strength of his might from the heaven of heavens. The heaven of heavens, that's going to be a common expression as we move forward. Second Ezra chapter 6, verses 1-4 to four says, At the beginning, before the measures of the firmaments were named. So Ezra obviously knew about the plural firmaments at the beginning. Similarly, in chapter 6 of 2 Ezra, verse 38, it says, I said, O Lord, you did speak at the beginning of creation, and did say on the first day, Let heaven and earth be made, and your word accomplished the work. Now that just, obviously, uh, is a parallel to Genesis chapter 1. But it's interesting just to see, you know, Ezra reiterating that truth. Later on in chapter 16 of his book, verse 56 to 58, it says, He said, Let the earth be made, and it was made. Let the heaven be made, and it was made. It is he who searches the deep in its treasures, who has measured the sea in its contents, who has enclosed the sea in the midst of the waters, and by his word has suspended the earth over the water. So there we have kind of a culmination of the events that took place on day one. Amos chapter 9, verse 6 says, Who builds his upper chambers in the heavens, and founds his vaults upon the earth, who calls for the waters of the sea, and pours them out upon the surface of the earth. The Lord, or Yahweh, is his name. So the prophet Amos just mentioned that Yahweh built his upper chambers in the heavens, or in the firmaments. These upper chambers, as you can look on the screen, I've kind of depicted as like a tent-like structure. We can call them chambers, I guess, just for the sake of this conceptualization. And he has founded his vault upon the earth. These are just interesting descriptors, especially when we take them serious. So we're back in 2 Ezra, chapter 8, verse 20, which says, O Lord who inhabits eternity, whose eyes are exalted, and whose upper chambers are in the air. So once again, we have this verbiage of chambers being up in the air. And, you know, in relation to Yahweh, who inhabits eternity, which is a, a really interesting um, 
way to put that because eternity is somewhere where you can't die. You live forever. You're immortal. You're spiritual. And that's a common understanding. The more we kind of pry open these firmament layers, so to speak, and examine them, the more we see that above our firmament, there are spiritual entities that were created and placed within these firmaments that can live forever. And we're going to talk about that more as we move along in this video and other videos. Deuteronomy 10. This is out of the Septuagint. Verse 14 says, Behold, the heaven and the heaven of heavens belong to the Lord your God, the earth and all things that are in it. Once again, that expression, heaven and the heaven of heavens. Kind of redundant if, you know, there's just open air or space or, you know, you're just kind of in a ethereal, misty, cloud-like environment that, you know, it just doesn't make sense to have these expressions, these the heaven of heavens, unless you understand the firmament. In 1 Kings chapter 8, 27, it says, But will God indeed dwell with men upon the earth? If the heaven and the heaven of heavens will not suffice you, how much less even this house which I have built to your name? We see that in 2 Chronicles 2, verse 6, the same thing. And who will be able to build him a house? For the heaven and heaven of heavens do not bear his glory. A couple chapters later in 2 Chronicles, in chapter 6, says, For will God indeed dwell with men upon the earth? If the heaven and the heaven of heavens will not suffice you, what then is this house which I have built? Now we're going to head over to Nehemiah. Out of the Septuagint, chapter 9, verse 6. And this is a really interesting verse. I love this. And Ezra said, You are the only true Lord. You made the heaven, and the heaven of heavens, and all their array, the earth, and all things that are in it, the seas, and all things in them. And you quicken all things, and the hosts of heaven worship you. The heaven of heavens, and all of their array. Now that's the Greek Septuagint version. The Masoretic Text version says all their hosts. But either way, it means the same thing. It's referring to other entities, other living beings that occupy the spaces, the firmament structures above our heads. And I think that uh, it can go overlooked, you know, these angelic hosts that were created, and we're going to get to that in just a few minutes, because they are part of day number one you know what are they doing up there are they standing around Yahweh and singing non-stop is that what they're doing since the day of their creation up to this point I think there might be some but thankfully we have many scriptures many texts that would reveal exactly what they're doing what their purpose is and the roles they play in terms of eschatology there are heavenly brothers above. They're rooting for us. They want what's best for us. They love us. They want us to obtain salvation. At least the ones that didn't rebel. Because there's a handful of those. But I'm getting ahead of myself. Let's move along. Taking a look at Psalm. Psalm 68 verse 33 says, To him who rides in the heavens, the ancient heavens, behold, he sends out his voice, his mighty voice. So here David, or the psalmist, is telling us that Yahweh can ride in the heavens, which is fascinating. Now this could be prophetically looking forward to the day when Yahweh comes down to the earth with his son, which would be during the millennial reign on the day of the Lord. Or perhaps he takes his chariot of cherubim and rides around in the heavens it's hard to say i don't know some of the prophets that were actually taken up in the spirit or were shown visions of the most high usually saw him sitting on his crystalline firmament structure like throne and so we don't get to see much action or movement of the most high um, other than the references to him coming down or even riding a cherub. I think David mentions that in Psalm somewhere. 
continuing on in the Psalms here, Psalm 115, verse 16, it says, The heaven of heavens belongs to the Lord. He has given the earth to the sons of men. So, Yahweh is in possession of all the heavens. I mean, the whole world. Everything is his, obviously. But his domain that he has claimed are the heavens, all the firmament structures. And he's given us the earth because we're made from the earth. We're earth dwellers. This is our home and it always will be. Even when we're resurrected one day. Even when the Son of God comes and brings our future home down to this earth plane. And we're going to be dwellers of the earth still. I think it's an important thing to remember. We're going to move into the book of Sirach, or commonly called Ecclesiasticus, chapter 43, verse 1. And it says, The pride of the heavenly heights is the clear firmament, the appearance of heaven in a spectacle of glory. I love that because that's a direct reference to, you know, a visual description of the firmament itself being clear. And we see that in other passages about it being a crystalline, like, clear substance. It's hard. It's uh, stretched out. And it has to be. It has to be a, a very tough, hard structure because it's holding a lot of stuff up. Let's go to the Apocalypse of Abraham. Chapter 19, verse 4. And it says, And while he was yet speaking, the expanse is open, and there below me, me being Abraham, were the heavens. And I saw upon the seventh firmament upon which I stood, a fire widely extended. So in this particular passage, Abraham was taken up in the spirit through all the firmaments up to the very top, the seventh layer. And he's standing on the seventh firmament structure and the expanses, which is a, another reference to the heavens or the firmaments. And these expanses are opening and he gets a glimpse into a couple of them. And we get to learn, you know, what resides in some of these other firmament structures. And it's very, very fascinating. And I'm going to be talking about that in probably the next video on, on day two, once we see uh, the last firmament put in place. So the last text that I want to elaborate on before we move to the second great work of creation on day number one is by... A second century Greek early church father, that's what he's known as, by the name Irenaeus. Now he had something really interesting to say as it pertains to the firmament structures and the heavens and pretty much everything that I've been discussing up to this point with regards to how they encompass the earth and how there are different layers. Now check this out. Now this world is encompassed by seven heavens in which dwell powers and angels and archangels, doing service to God, the Almighty and Maker of all things, not as though he was in need, but that they may not be idle and unprofitable and ineffectual. Now the heaven which is first from above, and encompasses the rest, is that of wisdom, and the second from it of understanding, and the third of counsel, and the fourth, reckoned from above, is that of might, and the fifth of knowledge, and the sixth of godliness, and the seventh, this firmament of ours, is full of the fear of that spirit which gives light to the heavens. For as the pattern of this, Moses received the seven-branched candlestick that shined continually in the holy place. For as a pattern of the heavens, he received this service, according to that which the word spake to him. Thou shalt make it according to all the pattern of the things which thou hast seen in the mount. Now, as well respected and influential as Irenaeus was and is, his works are not something that I derive doctrine from, and I definitely don't consider them scripture. I just thought it was very interesting and appropriate to, to share with you guys kind of his mindset with regards to the biblical creation model and cosmology in general. And actually, Irenaeus was influenced by yet another uh, apostolic church father by the name of Polycarp. And Polycarp was a direct disciple of John, the same John who wrote the book of Revelation, uh, 1 John, 2 John, 3 John, and obviously the Gospel of John. So I find that really interesting because 
you know, John, as we know, was taken up in the spirit and saw the heavens. He saw the new Jerusalem. He, he witnessed a lot of stuff and would have relayed that information that he was privy to, to Polycarp and Polycarp likely to Irenaeus. So that's very fascinating. All right, moving along. Now we're at the waters, the second great work of creation on day one, the waters. And here they come. Now, the way that I'm presenting this has the second firmament layer coming up, as well as the water kind of like full capacity in this firmament. So that's on purpose. And we're going to see why in a few minutes, but... So, the waters. Genesis 1, verse 2. The Spirit of God moved over the water. Now, I've heard a lot of theories regarding water, you know, the primordial waters and how, because we don't have much information about their creation or the mention of them being directly created, they must have always existed or something like that. And that's, that's not the case, especially when we uh, refer to Jubilees chapter 2, verse 2, which says, For on the first day... He created the waters. He created all things, guys. Everything was created. There was nothing that pre-existed besides Yahweh himself and Yeshua his son, who we've already established as being the firstborn of all creation. Coming in at number three and four, we have the earth and the abysses. And I have in brackets Sheol and Tartarus which is also referred to as the pit. And uh, it's important that we understand that Sheol and Tartarus are technically abysses. They are these cavernous compartments within the earth that were created intentionally, obviously because Yahweh knows the end from the beginning. He already knew mankind was going to need a place to dwell while waiting for the resurrection. And then we have Tartarus because he already knew that there were going to be rebellious watcher angels who we need to be chained up for their mischiefery. And here come the earth and the abysses. Okay, so the earth. Let's go to Isaiah chapter 40, verse 22. And I'm going to be reading out of the Septuagint again. It is he that comprehends the circle of the earth, and the inhabitants in it are as grasshoppers. He that set up the heaven as a chamber, and stretched it out as a tent to dwell in. So here we have a uh, description of the shape of the earth. Now, I know a lot of people, myself included, for many, many years, used to believe that, oh, here we go, we've got proof of a globe ball earth, right, coming from Isaiah's mouth. The circle of the earth. Circle is a ball, right? Well, no, it's not. Let's take a quick look at another illustration that I made. This is obviously an eagle eye perspective. It's from the vantage point of where the Most High dwells. When he looks down on the circle of the earth, because that's what this truly represents, this is what he sees. Now in 2nd Ezra, chapter 6, verse 1, it says, At the beginning of the circle of the earth. Now Ezra was a priest of Israel and a scribe, and he was practically contemporaneous with the prophet Isaiah, who also mentioned the circle of the earth. And, you know, they were intentional with the way that they communicated. They could have used other words, other descriptors, and the Hebrew actually has words if they wanted to have the reader, the audience, understand that it's a ball or a globe or something like that. But no, it's they used a precise word intentionally. And so I think that's really important, and we need to keep that in mind. And since we're already looking down on the earth at this particular vantage point, let's add some firmaments. We get a more clear picture as to what it's like looking from Yahweh's perspective. And it's the seven layers of the firmament. And as I had mentioned earlier, out of a passage from Sirach, the firmament is clear. And so, obviously, Yahweh's looking through the firmament you know, seven firmament layers down on the earth and the crystalline clear substance that it's made of allows for the inhabitants of heaven to look down without anything obstructing their view. 
and even though the firmament is described as being clear and even like a strong molten looking glass as some versions of Job 37 verse 18 say Yahweh obviously doesn't need anything to be clear for him to see all things I mean he can penetrate our hearts he knows what's in our hearts and our minds and what we're thinking he sees all things he's the creator of the heavens and the earth although I'm sure it might help some of the other entities which are about to be created on day one as we'll find out in my entertaining angels series watcher angels do just that they look down on the earth and they observe the movements and the works of men and they report back to the most high and so perhaps the clear firmament layers aid in their ability to watch properly who knows all right i'm going to jump back over to the main screen here and take a quick look at second peter chapter 3 verse 5 which says for they deliberately overlooked this fact and they being those who mock and scoff the creator and you know scoff at the understanding of the creator coming back to the earth they don't believe it that the heavens existed long ago and the earth was formed out of water and through water by the word of God. Peter was obviously intimately familiar with the goings on of the creation week. In particular, the idea or the concept of the earth being formed out of water and through water by Yahweh's word. And so, as we see here on the screen, we've got the water which was created on day one and then we have the land which was created through water and in subsequent days we're going to see this water recede when uh, the firmament on day two gets put in place and we'll cover that in the next video and before i move on to the next great work i just wanted to cover jubilees chapter two verse two once more a little aspect in that verse that mentions the abysses and when they were created which says he created the abysses. There we go. And as I said earlier, that would also imply Sheol, Tartarus, the pit, as it's understood as well. And by the way, I should mention that Sheol is the Hebrew word for the Greek equivalent, Hades. So keep that in mind, especially when you're in the New Testament, or if you're reading the Septuagint version of the Old Testament, where um, this particular compartment is mentioned. It'll be used as Hades in the Greek. And that's going to be covered in greater detail in my Underworld series, which I'm working on as well. So keep an eye out for that. This next great work has always been intriguing to me. And that would be the spirit beings, you know, always angelic servants. They are characters in this grand narrative that, I know I've said it before, are often overlooked or underappreciated because the canon, at least the Protestant canon here in the West that we have, doesn't elaborate on kind of their characteristics and just the roles in general that they play. Unlike literature such as First Enoch, Jubilees, Second Baruch, Second Ezra's, the Book of Tobit, books located in other canons that are abundant in information with regards to all of the angelic entities that were created on day number one. And sure, we get quite a bit of information in the books of Genesis through Revelation. However, the character development in the aforementioned extra-biblical texts really is unmatched, so I highly recommend that you would check those out. And after that buildup, I now present to you the angels. And just like that, Yahweh called them into existence. So we're going to jump back into Jubilees chapter 2 again. Because that chapter is just full of insight. And we're going to start in verse 2. It says, For on the first day he created all the spirits which served before him, the angels of the presence and the angels of sanctification, and the angels of spirit of fire, and the angels of the spirit of the winds, and the angels of the spirits of the clouds, 
and of darkness, and of snow, and of hail, and of hoarfrost, and the angels of the voices, and of the thunder, and of the lightning, and the angels of the spirits of cold, and of heat, and of winter, and of spring, and of autumn, and of summer, and of all the spirits of his creatures, which are in the heavens and on the earth. So, the biggest reason I love this passage in Jubilees, as it pertains to angels, is Quite frankly, there's no mention of angels being created in Genesis' account. It's silent when it comes to the creation of water and angels. But thankfully, we have Jubilees chapter 2, which informs us that water was created on day number 1, along with all of the spiritual entities that were created. Now, if we go over to Job 38 verse 7, I'm going to read both versions out of the Septuagint and the Masoretic text. Starting with the Septuagint, it says, When the stars were made, all my angels praised me with a loud voice. And the Masoretic text says, When the morning stars sang together, and all the sons of God shouted for joy. Now the sons of God is a term used for the angels. Also for us, because we will be made like the angels, and thus become sons of God in that way. But what's fascinating here is we know for sure that these angels, these sons of God, were around. They existed before day number four, which is when the sun, moon, and stars were created. So we can speculate which day. Was it first, second, or third day that they were created? Thankfully, we have Jubilees chapter two, which just flat out tells us that it was on day number one. And we go to second Baruch chapter 21 verse six, and this is really interesting. You that rule with great thought the hosts that stand before you, also the countless holy beings which you did make from the beginning, of flame and fire, which stand around your throne, you rule with indignation. So he created them from flame and fire, which is interesting when you really think about the physiology and just the physics regarding the angels and their capabilities in terms of the creation and how they can come and go quickly and, you know, they can wreak havoc and destruction with little to no effort on their part. They were created from flame and fire, yet they're also referred to as spirits. So spirits can come from flame and fire, and my speculation is Yahweh created them from the fire and flame that circumvents his throne, which I think he was always on from the very beginning and before the beginning, obviously from eternity. And this passage out of Second Baruch seems to correspond well with what the writer of Hebrews says in his first chapter, chapter 7, which says, And of the angels, he says, Who makes his angels spirits and his ministers a flame of fire? And that's a quote from Psalm 104.4, which says he makes his messengers, or his angels' spirits, his ministers a flaming fire. And for those who have followed this channel long enough, you'll be familiar with the teachings about what we, as newly resurrected sons of God, are going to experience in terms of our body and our physics and our spiritual physiology, if you will. That being spirit and water so angels were made of spirit and flame and fire whereas we're going to be made of water and spirit and if you're interested in learning more about what your resurrected immortal body of water and spirit is all about i have a three-part water and spirit teaching on my channel that you can definitely check out as well as a video that i did about a year ago called what does being born again really mean so check those out if you guys are interested in that. Okay, so let's move along to the sixth great work on day number one. The darkness. Now, honestly, the order in which I've placed these seven great works are up for debate. And for those who have been paying attention up to this point, I started out this conceptualization with... Yahweh kind of in the darkness which I suppose would place the darkness right around the first thing that he created um, but it's really hard to say 
If we move to Genesis chapter 1 verse 2, it says, Darkness was over the deep. Jubilees 2.2 2 says, He created the darkness, eventide, and night. So he created it. And it's, like I said, it's really hard to say whether or not this was something that he created kind of subsequent to other things that were being created on day number one, or if it was one of the first things that he created, because it has to contrast the light from itself. So the likelihood of it already existing before, say, the firmaments or the waters, the earth, the abysses, is rather high, in my opinion. But for the sake of fluidity in the presentation, this is the order that I've established. Now we're reaching the end of this video with the last great work, which is the light. A rather important thing that was created. And honestly, it's a aspect of creation that I struggled with in terms of my understanding for many years until I realized the difference between the light that the father created on day number one as opposed to the light that was created on day four from the heavenly luminaries, the sun, moon, and stars, which provide their light for the inhabitants of the earth. And I'm going to touch base on that once I get to creation day number four. So let's just bring the light in real quick. There it is. And we're going to read Genesis 1, verse 3 to 5. It says, And God said, Let there be light. And there was light. And God saw the light that it was good, and God divided between the light and the darkness. And God called the light day, and the darkness he called night. And there was evening and there was morning, the first day. And here is our division between light and darkness. We're going to jump over to Jubilees chapter 2, verses 2 to 3, where it says, For on the first day he created the light, dawn and day, which he has prepared in the knowledge of his heart. Second Ezra, chapter 6, 39-40 says, And then the Spirit was hovering, and that's referring to the Spirit of God hovering over the waters back in Genesis. And darkness and silence embraced everything. The sound of man's voice was not yet there. Then you did command that a ray of light be brought forth from your treasuries, so that your works might then appear. And before I expound on what Ezra's was referring to with the light coming from Yahweh's treasuries. My last text that I'm going to talk about in this presentation comes from Apocalypse of Abraham, chapter 19, verse 4, which says, I saw upon the seventh firmament upon which I stood a fire widely extended and the light, which is the treasury of life. So Abraham saw the light that Ezra has just referred to that came from Yahweh's treasury so that all things may appear. And it's referred to as the treasury of life, this light, which has implications involving immortality. Now, this isn't going to be the video that I expound upon with regards to where I'm going with that, but let's just say John doesn't refer to God as being light and James referring to the Father as being the Father of Lights in vain. 